So my talk today is Fertility and Career, Can You Have Both? So since the sexual revolution of the 60s and the advent of the contraceptive pill, women have been told that they can have it all. They can live vibrant and fulfilling lives with a successful career and have a family. And it's so easy that um, you can have it, the career won't be impacted with your, by your family and your family won't be impacted by your career. Well, it's 2024 now and we know that's a lie. Two of the major barriers to women achieving the highest positions in their industries is the perception of and lack of understanding of women's reproductive health and the impact of having children. Women's bodies are different to men's and it follows that we have specific requirements and needs which men do not have, such as periods, pregnancy and menopause. To compete with men, women have often had to hide this side of themselves, not draw attention to it, not complain or raise any kind of issue for fear of being perceived as less than men, as weak or as not committed to our careers. But women should embrace their femininity, educate themselves about their unique bodies and demand specific and tailored healthcare as well as whatever support they need in the workplace without shame and without fear of repercussions. So the focus of this year's conference is on young women's health. So we have to start with fertility education. What do you remember about sex education at school? <laughs> Probably something about a sperm and an egg, how to put on a condom, and being terrified about sexually transmitted diseases. You probably weren't taught about the reality of a woman's biological clock, or if you were, the concept at ages 11 to 16 was abstract at best. You definitely weren't taught about the menopause, as that was years off. Essentially, you were probably taught how not to get pregnant. Our fertility education in schools is woeful and not fit for purpose. As young women, we understand very little about our bodies. We know we'll get a period once a month, but we're not taught about the importance of tracking our periods or understanding that especially heavy periods or unusual pain is not normal. Even if young women seek medical advice about this, we know they're often fobbed off and that diseases such as endometriosis, adenomyosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome take years to diagnose and can impact on fertility. We know a bit about PMS, but we don't really understand about our hormones and their impact on our fertility. So, we leave school with minimal understanding of our bodies and go out into the world wholly inequipped for what lies ahead when we reach that point in our lives when we want to start trying for a baby. There's a school of thought that says that until a woman has decided she wants to become a mother, there's no need or impetus for her to understand what her fertility looks like. It's only at the point she starts trying for a baby does she need to know. What's the point of worrying about it beforehand? I don't agree with this way of thinking. Knowledge is power, and power um, it gives you op knowledge gives you options. So in 2021, the standardised mean age of first-time mothers increased to 30.9 years, the highest it's ever been. When I was born in 1979, the mean age was 26.8 years. My mother was actually 21. I had my first baby at 37. And since 1973, when the mean age was 26.4 years, the lowest it had been, since records began in 1938, the average age has increased year on year. So why are women having children later? One reason is likely to be the intersection with a woman's career. Society has changed and women have more and better opportunities than in our mother or grandmother's um, generation. We're not expected to just stay home and have babies anymore, but to go to work, excel in our careers and have babies. Just don't allow having babies to affect your career in case you commit career suicide. Even Adele thought she was committing suicide when she, had her, um, when she was pregnant. So, and this is where the fallacy of having it all comes in. Leaving work to have a baby, especially any kind of work in a male-dominated environment, it's terrifying. Will your job be there when you get back? Should you even take your full maternity leave entitlement? Or should you go back sooner to show how dedicated you are to your work? Will you miss out on a promotion? Will you lose the exciting projects? How on earth do you cover childcare? Can you afford it? What if your child is sick? They've now started school, but school finishes at three. How are you going to pick up your child from school and be taken seriously at work? The worries are endless. Welcome to the motherhood penalty. But what if those problems are ones you desperately want to have, but you're struggling to conceive? 
It's one thing telling your employer you're pregnant and taking your statutory or enhanced maternity leave, which is protected in, in law, and hoping there won't be any negative consequences. It's another, another thing entirely to fess up to your employer that you're struggling to conceive and need time off for fertility appointments, outing yourself as wanting a baby before there's even a baby. Currently, time off for fertility appointments or time off to recover from a miscarriage is not protected in law. Women, therefore, are even more vulnerable if they admit to their employer that they are struggling to conceive. And this is where we need change. So the World Health Organization defines infertility as a disease of the male or female reproductive system defined by a failure to achieve pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. There are 48 million couples and 186 million individuals living with infertility globally. And this doesn't include single people or same-sex couples who don't fit the WHO um, definition and who require assisted reproduction from the outset. We know that one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage, and so it's likely that there will be numerous people in your network who have lived through that trauma. And at the same time as infertility rates are increasing, the birth rate globally is falling. More and more people are going to be experiencing some kind of reproductive issues during their working lives. And for women who have a biological clock, it can be difficult to pursue a demanding career and be able to prioritise having children at the optimum time when the system we're working in simply isn't set up to support those decisions. So, as a young person entering the workforce but not yet thinking about reproductive years, what should you be doing? I talked earlier of the school of thought that says until a woman is ready to try for a baby, there's no need for her to um, really understand her fertility. But what if by then it's too late? Kira Jones discovered that she was perimenopausal with the AM AMH of a woman in her 40s when she was just 19. Luckily, she was working at a fertility clinic, and because she had discovered her condition early enough, she was able to freeze her eggs to at least give her the chance of having biological children in the future. Had she not tested at that young age, she would likely not know that there was any issue until she'd wanted to try for a family, and by then she may have had no viable eggs, leaving her with donor conception as her options. So my first tip for young people to, uh, is to understand their bodies, their hormones, and to actively think about their fertility, even at a young age. That biological clock is real. Science can help, but there is no substitute for the personal empowerment of knowledge. I've shouted out fertility on the slide, as they fully believe in this ethos and provide at-home um, hormone testing kits to give women that information at an early stage. Secondly, Seek out employers who support and champion their female staff and who have acknowledged that the female reproductive life cycle is real and who have put support systems in place to ensure that their female staff are not disadvantaged at work by their reproductive cycle or the desire to have children. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that you should ignore or hide the uniqueness of your femininity for fear of being perceived as less than men, as weak or as not committed to your career. My view is that we are different, and there should be no shame in that. Our biological makeup, our childbearing capacity, and our hormonal differences should be acknowledged and, where appropriate, taken into account. Women are set back not by raising this issue, but by ignoring the biological differences between women and men. So how can young women spot a potential employer who recognises the importance of supporting their employees through reproductive challenges, maternity and beyond? Look for a fertility officer. That's me in the Daily Mail. <laughs> so, <laughs> I woke up on Sunday morning to find this there. I had no idea it was going to be there. So I am my law firm's fertility officer, and I'm a dedicated point of contact for any employee who has any kind of fertility issue. And the very fact that we've appointed this role signals to our staff that, that this is an issue we care about, and importantly, it removes any work kind of worry that the employee has about who to go to and creates a safe space for employees to share without fear that to do so could jeopardise their position at work. So what does a fertility officer do? The role involves assisting employees with attending fertility appointments during work hours by reallocating work, signposting to external resources and connecting employees to peers for further support. Essentially, being an empathetic manager who is a trusted person to help rebalance pressures and prioritise work at a critical time in an employee's fertility journey. Why do I think having the role is important? Well, the stats speak for themselves. 
One in four women experience unfair treatment at work after disclosing fertility issues. 69.5% of people took off of time off sick whilst going through fertility treatment to hide the fact that they were going through treatment as they didn't feel comfortable to disclose. 61% didn't disclose that they were having treatment because of lack of legal protection and fears around the impact of the career. 18% of respondents left their jobs due to the impact of fertility treatment. And 93% of women felt that their career had been impacted in some way by fertility challenges and associated treatment. So in addition to a fertility policy officer, look for an employer who has fertility and baby loss policies. Whilst the law hasn't caught up yet, there are many companies and corporations who have such policies. So fertility policy should ideally be on a firm's website, in my view, so you can see it before applying, or given to you as a matter of course by a recruiter, or by the firm at the interview stage. No one's going to ask for this otherwise. The employment market is competitive, not just for potential employees, but also for the employers who are looking to recruit the best talent. Companies are waking up to the fact that some kind of fertility benefit will stand them out amongst competitors, as well as retaining their talent. And if you don't know if your employer has such a policy, or if they don't have one, ask for one. Sometimes it takes that bold person to ask for something for things to change. Is the company a fertility-friendly employer? So with accredited status, my law firm Burgess Me was the first UK company to achieve this status with fertility matters at work. The accreditation process provides training to staff so that everyone can understand what going through a fertility journey can involve so that anyone going through it is better supported. Is the company signed up to the Fertility Workplace Pledge? Nikki Aiken, MP, spearheads this initiative, which is a voluntary scheme designed to get employers on board before the law hopefully changes in the future. I am part of Nikki's working group, who are putting together an APPG on fertility support in the workplace with the aim of changing employment law so that people who will be entitled to pay time off for fertility treatment just as they are with antenatal appointments. But until the law changes, the workforce is reliant on companies voluntarily putting support systems in place. Lastly, young women should listen to my podcast. <laughs> uh, my passion for opening up the conversation about fertility issues in the workplace led to the creation of Infertility in the City, of which I'm extremely proud. We started out as live events where professionals in the legal sector spoke honestly about their experiences of fertility challenges to an audience keen to learn more and implement their learnings in their own firm. And we're now award-winning podcast with three seasons under our belt and a fourth to be released. The purpose of the podcast is to amplify the voices of professionals who have navigated fertility challenges whilst also pursuing demanding careers. We hear so much about how undergoing fertility treatment is gruelling, painful, emotional, expensive and all-consuming. Infertility doesn't discriminate. It can affect absolutely anyone, no matter their sex, their age, their race, their financial status, their sexuality status. The more we talk about our experiences and share the things that have helped us, we educate others and create more open cultures and a working environment which is better set up for women throughout her reproductive life cycle. Oh, thank you very much, sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How come